welcome everybody for the first Rocky Mountain Mathematical Physics Seminar. And uh, we are recording this seminar and uh, plan on putting it online afterwards. Our first speaker is Daniel Spiegel from the Physics Department of CU Boulder. And he will speak about super selection sectors and braiding in algebraic quantum mechanics. Please. OK, let me share my screen. OK, so um, thanks for having me as the first speaker here. Uh, like Marcus said, my talk is on super selection sectors and braiding in algebraic quantum mechanics. Um, it is going to be kind of heavy on the math, um, probably more heavy on the math than the physics. Um, but so do ask your questions. And I think, how are we doing questions? So you raise your hand, right? Does everybody know how to do that? OK, so let's get started. So first, I'm going to lay the groundwork here, uh, the mathematical groundwork. I'm going to review the basic notions of state and observable and algebraic quantum mechanics. Um, and then I'll define what a super selection sector is in algebraic quantum mechanics. And there's several different ways to look at this. And all of them are very useful. Um, uh, to talk about locality, that's one of the things that algebraic quantum mechanics is good for. We talk about quasi-local algebras, so I'll define those and show how they're used. And then we'll move into part two of the talk, and I'll start talking about, okay, so I've defined all this mathematical structure, now I need some physics. Um, what makes a super selection sector interesting? What makes it physical? And what is the structure? So this, this is given by these localized transportable endomorphisms. So I'll define what that is, and I'll put a bunch of structure on that. OK. So we've already had several talks last semester in the mathematical physics seminar about C star algebras. So I wasn't planning on defining what a C star algebra is. Let's just agree and move on. But a state on a C star algebra, I will define. So a state is a linear functional from the C star algebra to the complex field um, that maps positive elements to positive numbers. So a positive element, oh, I have my, have my laser pointer here. OK, that's not working. There we go. So A star A, capital A is an element of the algebra. That's what a positive element looks like. And I have to normalize it. So that's given by omega 1 equals 1. And so that's called a state. The set of all states we denote by S of A. And the physics, the interpretation here is that when you act a state on an observable, so when you act omega of A or omega of A star A, that's giving you the expectation value of the observable A or A star A in the state omega. OK. So some fast facts about states. First of all, there are states. Uh, it would be very bad if there aren't, but there are. States are automatically continuous. So that positive assumption automatically implies continuity. And this omega of 1 equals 1 implies that the norm is 1. So the state space is weak star closed, which means that pointwise limits of states are states. So if I have a, in other words, if I have a sequence of states, and it converges pointwise to a function, then that function is a state. This gives a topology, and the state space is compact in that topology by the banach ala oglu theorem. And you can also show that the state space is convex. OK, so that brings us oh, to what a pure state is. So the Krein-Milman theorem says that if you have a compact convex subset, then it's the closed convex hull of its extreme points. So we define a pure state to be an extreme point 
of the state space. In other words, uh, a state is pure if it cannot be written as a non-trivial linear combination of states. We call this PS of A. Okay, so how does this connect to the regular Hilbert space quantum mechanics um, that all the physicists know? And this is through representations of the algebra on a Hilbert space. So a representation, I mean a map pi from the algebra to the bounded operators on the Hilbert space, which respects all the algebraic operations. So it's a star, homomorph a star homomorphism, in other words. Um, and let's also assume that pi of the identity equals the identity. So that just rules out some trivial things. We say the representation is faithful if it's injective. We say a vector in the Hilbert space is cyclic if uh, acting on it with all the different observables gives us a dense subset of the Hilbert space. And we say that pi is irreducible if every non-zero vector is cyclic. Okay, so some fast facts about representations. If I have a faithful representation, then it's an isometry. So that sort of lets us identify the range of, a, of the representation with the algebra. And Schur's lemma here in the form of C star algebras is pi is irreducible if and only if pi of A prime, which is the commutant, so the prime here denotes the set of all uh, operators in the Hilbert space that commute with everything in the algebra. So that Schur's lemma says I'm irreducible if and only if the commutant is uh, just C times the identity operator. Okay, so to get, we can get from a state to a vector in a Hilbert space, a state on a C-style algebra, and that's the gelfand nymark segal con construction. So if you have a state, um, then there exists a representation and a cyclic unit vector, which represents that state in this sense. So this on the right-hand side, you see the expectation value of the observable A in the way that it's defined in quantum mechanics in every physics class. And on the left, you see it as I defined it earlier. Um, so the gelfand nymark segal or GNS representation is unique, essentially up to unitary equivalence. So if I have another representation, another cyclic vector, um, such that it represents the state in this way, then there's a unique unitary that maps the two cyclic vectors to each other. And that gives me unitary equivalence of the two representations. So we call this unitary equivalence of the representations. When one, when one representation equals the other representation up to conjugation by a unitary. And a key fact here is that the representation, the GNS representation is irreducible if and only if the state is pure. So we have a correspondence between irreducible representations and pure states. Okay, so if you've learned something about C star algebras, that might have been a review by now, um, but hopefully this is new. So I'm going to define a C star, uh, a super selection sector according to these equivalent conditions. So two states are in the same super selection sector if either their GNS representations are unitarily equivalent. That's the same as if they're connected by a continuous path in the state space. Here, the norm topology is inherited from the state space being uh, in the dual, a subset of the dual space of the C star algebra. Or there exists a unitary uh, in the C star algebra, not in the Hilbert space, but in the C star algebra, um, that gives me, that, that translates between the two states by conjugation. 
Okay, so this defines an equivalence relation and the equivalence classes are the super selection sectors. Um, right, and, and another fact here, if I have an irreducible representation, then every vector in the Hilbert space gives me a pure state and that completely describes one super selection sector. Okay. So we have some ways of telling, uh, or we have at least one way I've written here of telling when things are in the same super selection sector. So if the norm of the difference of the states is less than two, then they're in the same super selection sector. So that's pretty good. That's pretty powerful because the triangle inequality says that this is no more than two. So if the triangle inequality is not saturated, then they're in the same super selection sector. Um, and some examples here, the finite dimensional C star algebras just have one, they act on a Hilbert space. So uh, MNC, the matrix algebra acts on CN in the way you expect. And that's the one irreducible representation. But in general, C star algebras have lots and lots of super selection sectors and not all of them are physically relevant. So in the second half, we're gonna to have to define criterion that say what a physically relevant super selection sector is. And ultimately the physics that we're getting to here is that the super selection sectors label charge quantum numbers. So they tell you about the charged particle content of your theory. Um, okay. Let me pause there for a second and see if there are any questions. Okay, I'll keep going. So as promised, we're gonna talk about locality. So a C star algebra can define a notion of locality for us. And the first thing we're gonna start with is well, we're gonna build a net of C star algebras and have a net of something you need a directed set. So we're gonna have a directed set that has a orthogonality relation, perp here. So if I have two elements in the directed, or if I have, yes. So first it's a symmetric relation. So if something is perpendicular to, the, uh, if alpha is perpendicular to beta, then beta is perpendicular to alpha. Um, if alpha is in the directed set, then there exists something perpendicular to it. If alpha is less than or equal to beta and beta is perpendicular to gamma, then alpha is perpendicular to gamma. And finally, if alpha is perpendicular to beta and alpha is perpendicular to gamma, then there exists delta such that alpha is perpendicular to delta and delta is bigger than beta and gamma. Okay, so that's a bunch of mathematical axioms, but the examples are very simple. The examples, the perpendicularness just, or the orthogonality just encodes some sort of separation in space. So for QFT, where algebraic quantum field, or where algebraic, uh, this algebraic methods were born uh, in the study of QFT, the orthogonality relationship is space-like separation. And the indexing set is bounded open sets of space-time. So that's what I've tried to draw here. I have some bounded open set O1, some bounded open set O2, and here's the causal complement, everything. Uh, the causal complement of O2, meaning everything that's space-like separated is here on the left of this red wedge. And also there's a, another uh, red wedge on the right that I didn't draw but I have a space-like separ separated region there. For a lattice system, uh, we can also do this. And the directed set is just the finite subsets of the lattice. And orthogonality is just disjointness. So it's as simple as it could possibly be. And here's my little kindergarten level picture. I have two finite subsets of the lattice and they're disjoint. So very simple. <laughs> 
Okay, so once I have such a directed set, I assume to be given a C star algebra for each index or for each region or finite set, whatever. And I assume that they form a nest, uh, an increasing nest of C star algebras so that if uh, alpha is greater than beta, oh, I suppose I forgot to mention in my examples before, the partial order here is just inclusion. So again, very simple. So if one region is included in the other, then the C star algebra is included in the other. Okay, that's what I'm saying here. So that mathematically allows me to form the inductive limit. In other words, I take the union of all those algebras and I complete it with respect to the norm. And that gets me a new C star algebra, which I'll call A. Um, and the, the union A naught is dense, okay? And I also suppose in order to encode locality that if two things are separated or disjoint, then all the observables commute with each other. So this says nothing. This is not to say anything about particle statistics yet. Uh, this is just to say that real observables commute with each other if they're in space-like separated regions. So I, I suppose I should say the interpretation here of A of alpha is that these are the observables that are localized in the region alpha. Okay. So in this situation, I call A0 or A0 the local algebra and A the quasi-local algebra. Okay, so for lattice spin systems, how is this usually constructed? Um, well, for each lattice site, I have some spin and that corresponds to a matrix algebra, MNC at that lattice site. And then for a finite subset, I take the tensor product of all of those. So I take the tensor product of a bunch of matrix algebras. And the embedding is given by, you give me a tensor and I just put identities in the bigger algebra wherever I didn't have a lattice site before. So in other words, if I have two regions, lambda one, subset of lambda two. The embedding is given by a tensor with A's going to a tensor with B's, where B, V, V here is a vertex, lattice vertex, B, V equals A, V, if V was in lambda one, and it's the identity otherwise. So then you can use this quasi-local algebra construction to construct the infinite tensor product of C star algebras. And that's a very useful thing because it's much harder to do that with Hilbert spaces. You might be tempted to construct the infinite tensor product of Hilbert spaces for a lattice system, but it's not so simple and it's really not unique is the problem. Okay. So let's talk about states on a quasi-local algebra. Before I gave you a criterion to tell if two states were in different super selection sectors, uh, if omega one minus, or sorry, if they're in the same super selection sector, then omega one minus omega two is less than two. And here, this is a criterion to tell if I'm in different super selection sectors. So I'm in the same super selection sector. If uh, you give me an epsilon and I can give you a finite region where these, uh, these states are epsilon close outside that region. So let me just say that again. Omega one and omega two are pure states in the same super selection sector, if they are. Then for every epsilon, there exists an alpha in I, so a region such that uh, absolute the magnitude of omega one of A minus omega two of A is less than epsilon times the norm of A for any beta orthogonal to alpha in A in the orthogonal algebra. Uh, 
So the proof is very simple. And it comes from that fact I told you before, where, uh, or at least one way to do it, is if omega-1 and omega-2 are in the same super selection sector, then they're related by a unitary. So I have this unitary in my quasi-local algebra. I can approximate it by something in my local algebra. And that thing in my local algebra commutes with A. And then I approximate again, and U star U is 1. So the idea here is that I approximate things in my quasi-local algebra with things in my local algebra. And I use this orthogonal algae relation to get the commutativity when it's important. So the converse to that statement doesn't always hold, but it does hold in lattice spin systems. And that's actually kind of important. Um, OK. So now we move on to part two here. I've laid the mathematical groundwork. We have to talk about what constitutes a physically relevant super selection sector and then do more mathematics. Okay, so let's assume our theory has a unique translation invariant ground state. Okay, so translation invariant in the two examples I gave, either a lattice, say like Z2 or Minkowski space, there's some translation invariance. That's not necessarily built into the notion of a quasi-local algebra, but it's easy enough to build it in. So we have a unique translation invariant ground state omega and a faithful ground state representation or GNS representation pi naught. And we're only gonna consider representations which are unitarily equivalent to pi naught outside certain regions of interest. And I'm being vague here. Uh, so we'll consider these regions O and we'll look, we'll restrict representations to the C star algebras outside or orthogonal or complementary to O, however you wanna say it. And we, we're gonna ask that that be unitarily equivalent for every region O that we consider. Okay, so what regions O do we consider? These are regions where uh, your charge creation operators are supported generally. So this, the, this whole analysis of super selection sectors goes back to Dockler, Hogg, Hog and Roberts. So that's DHR. And they considered uh, bounded regions for their O's. They were these double cones. So it's the intersection of a backwards light cone uh, right here with a forwards light cone right here. And that gives you one of these regions O. Um, but the doppler hogg roberts criterion is very restrictive. Uh, it doesn't let you consider uh, gauge theories. I think I, think I said that right. So. Um, so Buchholz and Friedenhagen generalized that. So now instead of these uh, bounded regions, they have regions of infinite length and they considered uh, space-like cones. So by that, I have drawn this blue wedge here. This is in one dimensional space in one dimensional time. This blue wedge is in uh, the space-like region of the origin. And then I could consider all translates of that. And I could consider space like cones in any direction. Um, and you can do a similar thing in however many space time dimensions you want. So then Nikens recently has transferred these uh, QFT methods to the lattice systems. And his analysis is very similar to the Buchholz Friedenhagen uh, analysis. So he considers also cones, although this time they're wedges in, on your lattice. Okay, so, so this is an example uh, ripped from Nikon's paper on the Toric code. I'm not gonna go into any details on the Toric code, but I will mention it. 
and I'll qualitatively say some things about it. So in the toric code, uh, well, there's this Z2 lattice here, but the, the spin sites are actually on the edges of the lattice. So that's, that's just why to explain why the edges here are filled in everywhere where this cone intersects. So that's the kind of region O that you consider in a lattice. And I, I think Nikens only does it for the toric code, but I suspect that this can perhaps be done more generally. Um, OK, so just to comment on that a little bit more, because I it was a little weird when I when I first saw this. So these regions, O, I can think of as subsets of my directed set. I can think of them as directed subsets of my directed set. So if O is directed, then this orthogonal complement set is also directed, and that's I suppose I should have read the first bullet point first. That's a consequence of this fact that between two any between any two of my regions in my original directed set, I can just take their union, and I have another uh, uh, another valid region in I. So that tells me that if I have a directed subset of my directed set, its orthogonal complement is directed. I can then take or inductive limits and get new C star algebras, new quasi-local algebras. And those will naturally embed in my total quasi-local algebra A. So there's, there's a, a structure to this. Uh, and, and there's some benefit to, be, to being uh, sort of abstract here, I think, in how we talk about this index set. OK, um, another key point that's going to come up in a slide or two is that we have to notice that the collection of regions contains all translates. So in, I intentionally uh, include, for every space like cone, every translate of it. And for every wedge in the lattice, every translate of it. OK. So the thing is the representations, restricting a representation to a subalgebra is not the nicest formalism for talking about, uh, talking about what your relevant super selection sectors are. So we'd rather talk about uh, an endomorphism, these localized transportable endomorphisms. So an endomorphism rho from A, the quasi-local algebra, to itself. We say it's localized in this region O. If rho of A equals A, if it does nothing in the orthogonal complement of that region. OK, so that, that is a very sensible definition. And we say it's transportable if given any other region or wedge or whatever. There is another endomorphism localized in that wedge. And there's a unitary that transports me or conjugates me from my original endomorphism to my new endomorphism. So in other words, if I start localized in one region, I can move myself to be localized in another region or via this charge transporter, OK? So the problem here, or the warning I want to give, is that V is not necessarily in the image or in, in the quasi-local algebra. We can really identify pi naught of A with the quasi-local algebra, because pi naught is faithful and therefore an isometry. OK, so that's going to cause problems. Uh, fast fact about these localized transportable endomorphisms, they're automatically isometries, which is kind of nice. So that means they're automatically injective. They're not automatically surjective. Um, right. And we're interested in the pure states 
and the irreducible representations obtained by composing with these localized transportable endomorphisms. So we're interested in states of the form ground state composed with endomorphism and respectively representations of the form ground state representation composed with uh, endomorphism. So the interpretation here, the physical interpretation is that this creates a charge. And um, right, so if I start with the ground state and I compose with rho, then I've created an excited state. And now you see, I, I was sort of circular in how I defined these O's. So the O's are where my charge transport or my, my charge creation operators are supported. Um, but you have to sort of know. I mean, I use these O's to define my rows, but uh, the motivation for the O's comes from the rows. So it's a little tricky. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to say on that. Right, uh, I, will, I will say one, one other thing. So since these are not necessarily automorphisms, they're not necessarily surjective, omega naught composed with rho is not necessarily pure. If it is an automorphism, then it is necessarily pure. And in the Torah code, they are automorphisms. But in general, uh, you can have endomorphisms that when you compose, you do get a pure state, and you can have other endomorphisms that when you compose like this, you don't get a pure state. So you just want to be concerned with the ones that give you a pure state in this analysis. OK. Um, right, so if we're going to talk in terms of these localized endomorphisms, then it better satisfy the original criterion that we imposed, which means our, our ground state representations and our excited state representations better be unitarily equivalent outside or on the orthogonal complement of these regions. The proof is very simple. Fix O. There exists an endomorphism localized in O and a unitary V that transports me, or that transports rho to sigma. But if A is uh, outside the support of sigma, then sigma will just be the identity. So I move my region of support far enough away outside the region that I'm concerned with. OK. So the converse is a lot more subtle. The converse being, if you give me a representation that's locally unitarily or unitarily equivalent to the ground state outside these local regions, uh, can you give me a, an endomorphism? Can you give me a localized transportable endomorphism? And the answer is kind of no. But if you require Hogg duality, here we have a double commutant. So, uh, if I require that the double commutant of the algebra in one of these localized re regions is equal to, first I take the complement of the region and then I take the, uh, then, then I take the commutant of the algebra. So that's called the Hogg duality. And that gets you some mileage. So from there, from what, if you have Hogg duality, then uh, from a representation, you can get a localized transportable rho. But the problem is that rho doesn't map the quasi-local algebra to itself. So it's not an endomorphism. So rho maps the quasi-local algebra, which I've identified with pi naught of A, to the bounded operators on my Hilbert space. And it it does this peculiar thing here. Um, when I map a, a 
observable algebra under rho, I get the double commutant. And the double commutant, it turns out, is equal to the weak operator closure of A. So I've introduced another topology on the bounded operators on Hilbert space called the weak operator topology. It's the topology of convergence in the inner product. So I suppose I should have written this in my slide, but oh well. Uh, in this case, actually, I can talk about the strong operator topology, which is just, again, the topology of pointwise convergence of operators. OK. So rho maps an algebra observable of observables into its closure in some topology on the bounded operators on Hilbert space, but not into itself. So actually, this doesn't occur in the doppler hogg roberts analysis and just in the Buchholz and Friedenhagen and Nikens analysis. And yeah, I'm going to stop talking about pi naught because, like I said, it's an isometry here. So let's let's see the solution in the Buchholz Friedenhagen and Nikens analysis. And it's going to be kind of weird, but it's going to work. So we observe that uh, these, if you fix a region and you consider all its translates, actually, these are wedges now that I'm considering. If you fix a wedge and you consider all its translates, this forms a directed set by reverse inclusion. So in other words, if I have two of these wedges, they'll intersect themselves at some, some region, and I can fit a wedge in there. Maybe it would have been good to draw that too. Uh, OK, so we're going to fix a wedge, fix a cone. And we're going to define an auxiliary algebra as an inductive limit. OK, here I have to make sure that this crazy algebra in here is an increasing, is this increasing nest in order to have this inductive limit. So uh, OA plus X, those guys are ordered by reverse inclusion. So if I take their complement, that'll be ordered by inclusion. The algebra net, uh, the, the, nest, the, the net of C star algebras that I already had respects inclusion. So A of, o of a, OA plus X complement is ordered by inclusion. That's good. That's what we want. And then I take a commutant, and it's now ordered by reverse inclusion. And then I take another commutant, and it's ordered by inclusion again. So I do have this inductive system that I can take the limit of and get a C star algebra. So call this the auxiliary algebra. And the, the upshot is that we're only going to consider charges or uh, we're only going to consider endomorphisms localized uh, in the complement of one of these wedges. In other words, we're only going to consider wedges that point in a direction different from this auxiliary wedge. OK, so if my auxiliary wedge is pointing down like that, I can consider wedges that go up or side to side. And these O's that I considered as my new regions of localization, those form a directed set. So that's good. Um, and I can extend. So now here's the key fact. I can extend my endomorphism, which was original, or I can extend my homomorphism, which was originally not an endomorphism, to an endomorphism of the auxiliary algebra. So now I can do this whole business of localized transportable endomorphisms, but on the auxiliary algebra. So I just had to enlarge my quasi-local algebra a little bit. Um, right. Now, you might say I've made a choice here. 
uh, by choosing an auxiliary cone or wedge, but it ends up, it doesn't really matter because I can localize my endomorphisms wherever I want. That's the beauty of transport or transportability. So if you give me a representation, I can get a localized transportable endomorphism out of it, and it can be localized wherever I want. So it can be localized in these regions that I've chosen that point away from my auxiliary wedge. Um, and the, the states that I get will be in the same super selection sector because they'll be the same up to conjugation by that unitary uh, intertwiner that was in the definition of charge transport. Okay, so this is the picture from Nikens' book. Uh, you pick some auxiliary wedge and you consider wedges that are in different directions or that lie in the complement for some translate of that wedge. Okay. So now that we have settled this issue, and if you don't want to think about auxiliary algebras, you don't really have to. I mean, we're just doing this localized transportable endomorphism business. We have an endomorphism on some algebra. So now that we have that, we're going to define this to be a category. We're going to give this a category structure, and we're also going to give it a monoidal structure. So or a tensor product. Okay, so the objects of this category delta are gonna be the endomorphisms. And the morphisms between the objects are gonna be the intertwiners, the, the charge transporters. So if I have two objects, the set of morphisms between them, I'm gonna denote as delta of rho sigma. That's the set of all bounded linear operators that intertwine rho and sigma for all A in the auxiliary algebra. Okay. And if this is going to be a category, I better be able to compose morphisms. And I can't just by first commuting uh, my charge transporter past. Okay. So uh, let me, let me say that again. Uh, if I have two charge transporters, I can compose them to get a new charge transporter. Um, and the composition is literally just function composition. So the composition in the category is literally just function composition. And this works by first commuting one past my endomorphism and then commuting the other past my endomorphism. So it couldn't be simpler. And I'll note that the irreducible representations or the irreducible um, endomorphisms, which are the ones that we're interested in, uh, correspond to those which have uh, the morphisms into themselves equaling only CI. So this is kind of like Scherz lemma again. Okay, so we have a category. Let's give it a monoidal structure. To give it a monoidal structure, I need a tensor product. And the way I'm going to define the tensor product of two endomorphisms is just by function composition again. So if that's going to be my tensor product, it better be true that the composition of two localized transportable endomorphisms is a localized transportable endomorphism. And it is. And this is because of all the nice structure that we have on our directed sets here. Um, so, right, if rho and sigma are endomorphisms localized in one region and another, then you just take a region that contains both of those and the composition will be localized in that. Okay. I've written the proof, but I think I'm going to skip past that. But it's, again, very simple. Um, I just have the power to commute things when I want to. Uh, 
Okay. Um, right. So this, oh, actually, maybe I should say, so if we have this uh, tensor product, I want to be able to define the tensor product, not just of um, two objects in my category, but also the tensor product of two morphisms. Um, and that that is actually in this proof. So I show that uh, if S and T are my charge transporters, then my charge transporter for the composition for the tensor product of my two endomorphisms is going to be S rho of T. And so that's what I've written here. So the tensor product of my charge transporters S and T is S rho of T. And now you see that it was really important that my uh, that my endomorphisms be defined on this bigger algebra because the, trans the transporters, the charge transporters are not defined in the quasi-local algebra. So I wouldn't have been able to act uh, rho on T otherwise. Fortunately, everything lives in the auxiliary algebra. So I have successfully defined a tensor product or in category uh, jargon, I've defined an associative bifunctor. And this is a strict monoidal category. Sometimes in a monoidal category, you have to have, uh, well, the tensor product of thing one and thing two, and then with thing three is only uh, equal to the other way around, the associative, uh, you know, use associativity up to a natural isomorphism. But in this case, it's strict, it's equality. So that's kind of nice. All right, let's define one more structure on this. So we have a category, we have a tensor product. Uh, we can now define a braiding. So a monoidal ca category comes with two bifunctors. The one that defines it, the tensor product, so rho sigma go to rho tensor product sigma. And then the one where I first switch the components and then do the tensor product. And a braiding is a natural isomorphism, which I'm going to call epsilon rho sigma, between these two functors. And it also has to satisfy these two additional criteria. Um, so what does this say? Let's just look at where the top line lives. The top line is a morphism from rho tensor sigma tensor tau to tau tensor rho tensor sigma. And this equation says that, uh, okay, switching rho and tau or rho tensor sigma with tau at the same time is the same as first switching sigma and tau and then switching rho and tau. So it's just a compatibility condition here. And a very similar thing for the bottom line. Okay. So we can define this on our category delta. And epsilon rho sigma, remember, okay, remember the endomorphisms were charge creation operators. So I think of rho and sigma Think of them like excitations of my ground state. So epsilon rho sigma will switch those or exchange, permute those two excitations. That's the physical interpretation here. OK, so how do you do that? Well, take two of these endomorphisms. Say they're localized in some region O and then choose a region orthogonal to O and transport one of them to that region. So I, I move one of the charges away from the other charge. And then I look at uh, the charge transporter V and I define epsilon by this formula. Um, I don't have a lot of intuition for this formula, 
but I can see that it is at least a morphism in the, uh, between the two objects that I want. So it's a morphism between rho tensor sigma, in other words, create rho, then create sigma, and sigma tensor rho, in other words, create sigma and create rho. So to do this epsilon, to define it, I had to make a lot of choices. I had to define, I had to, I had to choose this orthogonal region, O hat. I had to choose a new morphism, sigma hat, that would be localized in my orthogonal region. And I had to choose a char charge transporter. So I'm independent of those choices, except in two dimensions. And here's where the interesting thing comes in. In two dimensions, my braiding operator depends only on whether I'm to the right or whether my, uh, my orthogonal region O hat is to the left or to the right of my original region O. And left and right here is measured relative to my auxiliary cone. So in other words, in this picture, lambda hat being to the left of lambda means that I rotate clockwise, uh, or sorry, I rotate counterclockwise from lambda to lambda hat to get from one to the other without crossing over the auxiliary cone. So you have to choose in two dimensions. You have to choose whether you're gonna be on the left or the right, and you have to make a choice but you have to be consistent. So there's no anions, which are, uh, well, let me, let me just read this. So there's no anions in three or more spatial dimensions, dimensions uh, because there's no choice. And it turns out that if I exchange rho and sigma and then do it again, I just get the identity operator, nothing happens. So that's Bose and Fermi statistics. Because if I exchange two particles for Bose or Fermi, I get a, a plus or a minus sign. And then I do it again and I get a plus or a minus sign and they cancel. In two dimensions, uh, you can have this operation be non-trivial. And when that happens, we say we have anions or anion ex excitation. So this in particular, let me just briefly mention the toric code. I'm almost out of time, but just very briefly. So the toric code does have any on excitations. It has four super selection sectors, which we can think of as labeling two different kinds of charges. So I have uh, a row charge and a sigma charge and so I have one super selection sector for the ground state, one super selection sector for the row charge, one super selection sector for the sigma charge, and one super selection sector for when I have rho and sigma. Or, so that's rho tensor sigma or rho composed with sigma. Um, there's only four because these charges are their own antiparticles. So if I have two rows, then that's the same as having none in terms of total charge. Uh, the great thing about the Torah code is that these endomorphisms, these charge transporters and these braidings can be computed explicitly. And this is one of the big critiques that uh, algebraic quantum field theory had, that there was nothing you could do. There, were, there weren't enough examples. Uh, but for here, we have an example. We have actually plenty of examples uh, in, in this lattice framework. And in the Torah code, you can compute this Rating operator, and it gets you a minus identity. So it's not totally trivial. Thus, I have anionic excitations. OK, so just to conclude, the point is that these algebraic methods can be used to analyze the super selection sector, the particle exchange statistics, the charge quantum numbers of your physical theory. The cool thing is that these methods that were originally developed for algebraic QFT are now being adopted by uh, 
for the study of these lattice models, like the toric code. And it's much easier to write down a concrete lattice model. There's a whole program for doing this, um, which is an, another talk. Uh, but it's much easier to do that for a lattice model than for QFT. Uh, so hopefully this will renew interest in this field and in algebraic quantum mechanics in general and will lead to benefit for all. So that's it. Thanks. Some references. Thank you very much. Um, thanks the speaker for the nice talk. And uh, are there questions? Anyway, yeah, please. Hi, Daniel. Yeah, I have a, a question. So, so here you discuss the breeding of uh, two uh, um, excitations. Usually in physics, we are also interested in the fusion uh, of two excitations, like uh, the tensor product you, you mentioned just now. It can be uh, written as a direct, direct sum of a bunch of uh, other ex excitations. So, do you? Yeah, you can definitely do that in this framework too. Um, I didn't go over it because uh, I, my goal was to talk about the braiding, but you, uh -huh. can, you can do it in this framework. And basically you consider what super selection sectors you have. You take a uh, endomorphism from each, uh, and then you consider what happens when I tensor product, can I write that as a direct sum of endomorphisms from other super selection sectors? Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Hmm. Further questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. And uh, yeah, I'm. Um, and thank you for all uh, coming to the first Rocky Mountain Mathematical Physics Seminar. And uh, the invitation for the next one will be sent out soon. Thank you. Nice.